Good morning, and Happy New Year. It is great to be back with you after having had bronchitis for over two weeks, and I want to thank all of you for your prayers. One thing I was able to do while I was flat on my back or in a chair was to pray for many of you who were sick too, so there is uh, some positive things that can come out of an illness. I have some very good news to share with all of you. You can't see it, but you know what it is. This past uh, Monday, I went to the office up the road on 49, and I am now an official Louisiana resident with my own driver's license. <laughs> and my truck is now an official Louisiana truck uh, with plates here, so it's great to now uh, be here for real. And so I uh, really appreciate your encouragement in so many ways. I can't think of a more appropriate place for us to be studying this Sunday uh, in the brand new year uh, to kick off our studies in Genesis once again than right where we are in Genesis. Today we begin a study of four of the most important chapters in the book of Genesis. These chapters, verses, chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9, are so foundational and so important that I've decided today, rather than diving into the text of chapter 6 immediately, I want to do an introduction to the entire four chapters. So our basic principle today is we're going to look at the forest of those four chapters, and then starting next week, we'll start looking at the trees. Uh, another way of putting it, we'll take the bird's eye view today, and then we'll take the beetle's eye view uh, in uh, the coming weeks uh, as we look into those. For generations, children of all ages have loved the story that we're going to be looking at. Who can resist this tale of intrepid Mr. Noah, indefatigable Mrs. Noah, their three brave sons and daughters-in-law, and can you hear the echo of saws and hammers as the giant planks of the ark uh, reach up to the skies as it's, as it's constructed, and all those animals lumbering and hopping and galloping up the ramp two by two to get away from the raindrops, and then the downpour and, of course, the all-time gully washer of the deluge. It's irresistible, and yet there is so much more in these chapters than just the ark, the animals, and the flood. This picture, of course, looks more like a carnival cruise than what the Bible really describes, and this uh, little gal here on the bow, I don't know if you can see her, that's Kathy Lee Gifford, uh, but... Uh, that has no relation to the Bible, but nevertheless, it's a lot of fun to look at, and of course, artists for years have just gone to town on this story. When we started this series in Genesis, I shared with you that the book of Genesis and the Bible itself is really the story of God. And so, as we look in these next chapters, these chapters are about God as the real hero of the story and secondarily about Noah, a human hero, uh, as he became at that time a savior of the world. And so my main emphasis in these coming weeks is, although we're going to look at the ark and the animals and the flood, we're going to focus on God and on Noah. So in a nutshell, what are these chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9 of Genesis about? I think they answer two main questions about God and Noah. First, how far will God go to stop sin? And second, how far will Noah go to obey God? So this sermon has really two titles. Have you ever heard of a sermon with two titles before? Now you have. Let's pray and ask God's blessing as we launch into these great chapters today. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this new year and that we have the privilege to spend these precious minutes together to look into what this tells us, not just about a historical event many thousands of years ago, but, Father, what this has to tell us about you and what this has to tell us about how we, like Noah, can have a good relationship with you. And so I ask that your spirit would teach us this morning as we look into this introduction to these great chapters, and we want to commit this to you for your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Now, before we deal with the two big questions of the title, 
there's two other important questions that I want to deal with briefly. First question, was the flood worldwide or local? I personally believe that the flood covered our entire planet for the better part of a year, and I believe that the text of Genesis chapter 6 to 9 supports that. However, there are smart, godly Bible students who believe the flood was local and covered just the areas that were populated by mankind up to that point in history. Now, I just want to speak honestly with you. One of the reasons that some Christians reject a worldwide flood is because they think it's incompatible with their view of naturalistic evolution as God's method of creating the world over millions of years. Now, as I shared when we studied the first chapters of Genesis, I do not believe in evolution. But if you do hold to evolution, then you already believe that over the countless ages that this planet has been here, there have been other cataclysms in the Earth's long history. Ice ages, climate changes, and global disasters like the comet that they think killed the dinosaurs. So a worldwide flood in the time of Noah is not incompatible with even that point of view because it's just one of a number of different cataclysms that hit the earth. Now, another important question that I want to ask today but not deal with as we go along in these sermons is do Genesis chapters 6 to 9 support what is called flood geology? What is flood geology? Flood geology is a model that young earth creationists use to explain how geologic and fossil formations could have formed quickly during and after the flood instead of over millions of years of evolution. Personally, I think that flood geology is helpful for two reasons. First, Flood geology offers one plausible explanation of how God could have created the earth recently and how the flood could be the cause of the geologic and fossil formations that we see today. A second reason I think flood geology is helpful is that those who have studied this point of view, this model, have found what I think are legitimate challenges to the theory of evolution as traditionally taught. Now, having said that, I personally do not believe that flood geology has yet come up with all the answers that are necessary to explain Earth's origins. And I also don't think that as we look into these chapters of Genesis that we can prove 100% the flood geology model. So though I think it's helpful, I would just suggest to you it is a model. And so my emphasis as we go through these next weeks is going to be on what the text teaches us, not only about the flood, but of course about God, uh, rather than championing a theory as good as that theory might be. Now, there's one more thing I'd like to say by way of introduction here, and that is that these chapters, all of Genesis, but these chapters in particular that Moses wrote, have an incredible literary complexity. And I'd like to show you one of my famous charts, uh, that to show you how Moses, the human author, designed and wrote this. Now, <clears throat> this structure of these four chapters, and in your notes that I give out at the end or that email to you, I'll have all the chapter references for these, so you'll have those to look these up later if you're interested. But this is called a chiasm. It is a reverse structure, sort of like a Rorschach. It is a where the first entire part of the section mirrors the last part. Let's look at these. The entire narrative starting in chapter 6 starts with Noah and his three sons. Then God sees the earth and that all flesh have become corrupted. We'll look at that in a moment. God then instructs Noah before the flood, including the food that's to be eaten on the ark. Then he commands Noah to enter the ark and especially to take the clean animals and the birds. We'll talk about that. Flood, the flood begins, the ark is closed, the waters rise, the mountains covered. That's the entire first section. Then the pivot point of the entire narrative is God keeps his word, and through the flood, all land life dies. But also, God remembers Noah and those in the ark in grace. This is the hinge of the entire story. 
then everything that unfolded here folds back. The waters recede, the mountains are uncovered. The flood ends, the ark window is opened. God commands Noah to exit the ark, and the clean animals and birds that were taken on are now sacrificed. God instructs Noah after the flood, including the food that was to be eaten in the post-flood world. Then God promises to never again corrupt or destroy the earth, and now God sees the rainbow. And when we get to chapter 9, the revelation both in nature and spiritually of what the rainbow signifies is, I think, one of the most beautiful things in Scripture, so don't miss that. And then finally... The whole narrative ends with Noah and his son. So the structure of this is amazing as Noah, or as Moses rather, put it together. But even the time, let's look at the timings of the flood in the next slide. Seven days of waiting (coughs) before the flood, 40 days of the flood, 150 days of the water waxing, 150 days of the water waning, 40 days waiting for it to dry, seven days waiting to leave the ark over two periods. Now, I want to point out one thing that is so incredibly important. There's two sets of seven days at the end, only one set of seven days at the beginning. Moses does not manipulate the numbers. He doesn't stretch them. He doesn't exaggerate them. But notice to keep the parallelism, though there's only one set of seven days, he mentions it two times. So that for the people who heard this orally and memorized it, They could remember two sets of seven days at the end, one set of seven days, but mentioned twice. So the incredible integrity of Moses is he puts together this historical record of this event that really happened. So the structure of this is amazing, and as we study in the coming weeks, I'll try to bring out a few more examples of parallels and things in the text. Now let's get then to the central two questions that I believe are going on in these chapters. First question, how far will God go to stop sin. And I put this statement up here because it's so important. Sin is so serious to God, and sin's consequences are so destructive and dangerous that God destroyed the entire human race, all the animals, and shut down Earth's ecosystem for a year so that then God could reboot the entire system, bless, and start over with one family and representatives from the creatures of the animal kingdom that were on the ark. That is how far God will go to stop sin. Now, let's read the key paragraph in this entire section of Scripture that describes the Lord and his attitude toward this event. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. When the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on earth and that every scheme of his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe off from the face of the earth mankind whom I created, together with the animals, creatures that crawl on birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. This paragraph is incredibly important because it reveals something about God that we have not seen so far in the book of Genesis and in the Bible. Up until now in Genesis, we have seen that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. He couldn't have created otherwise. God is a person who thinks, speaks, and acts. God is a sovereign king in control of all things. God is holy, and he judges sin and sinners. But God is also all good, and he blesses, delights to bless, especially those who obey him. But now we see as though God's heart is surgically opened, and we realize God is not some cold, immovable object in the sky. God is a person with feelings and emotions. Our sin hurts God. Our sin grieves Him. Now, there's a mystery here, and I can't explain it, but we just have to present it. If God knows everything, then He knew from eternity past, that human sin would run so rampant in the days before the flood that he would have to take in and take drastic, step in and take drastic action to stop it. To God, the flood was like life-saving surgery in the human race in this planet. Sometimes doctors have to amputate a limb or even stop the heart temporarily 
and restarted in order to save a patient's life. To keep the human race from destroying itself, and of course eventually the animals, God basically shut down the world for a year. In mercy, really, he wiped out every living thing in order to start over after the flood. God's purpose all along was to bless. And when people refuse to receive his blessings, God goes to an alternate plan. So even though God knew all of this from eternity past, when it actually began to happen in time, we read here in that paragraph how God responded emotionally to it. And we can barely imagine how God must have felt as he looked out over the world at the people sinning to the degree that even every thought was thinking of something evil. Let me tell you a story. A good-looking guy courted a beautiful girl. He asked her to marry him. They had a storybook romance, got married, honeymoon, started their life together. That young groom spared no expense to build the perfect cottage, surrounded by beautiful trees and flower beds. He furnished it with every comfort and convenience because he loved his bride. And then, not long afterward, that young woman committed adultery in that very house. When the young man discovered what she'd done, he was heartbroken. He still loved her, but in his anguish, in his rage, he cried out, I wish I had never met you. I wish that I had never married you. I'm going to smash all the furniture. I'm going to cut down the trees, rip up the flowers, burn down the house because I can't stand to look at what you have done to our home. How that young man felt is a tiny glimpse of what Almighty God felt when he looked out and the entire human race was shaking their fist in his face. So what did God say? I'm sorry I ever made you. You see, over the years, we have not done justice to this story in Genesis. We have reduced this to a cutesy kid story about a boat and a bunch of animals. This is a story, brothers and sisters, that brings us face to face with God. And we see tears streaming down his face. If you want to know how God felt, Before the flood, fast forward several thousand years and look at when God visited this planet as Jesus Christ. Jesus stood outside the city of Jerusalem and he wept and cried, How often I wanted to gather your children like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. And if that's how God felt thousands of years ago, how do you think God feels today when he sees us polluting the environment, wiping out animal species, exploiting the poor, abusing children? I'll tell you how God feels. God is brokenhearted, and he is mad. And this is the reason God is going to send Jesus back a second time to this planet to fix things. One of the things that many people say is, why doesn't God do something about all the bad things in the world? Well, he's going to. Just be patient. God is a lot more patient than we are. So he's just biding his time. But as we will study next week, God's patience has limits. And when God's patience runs out, man, watch out. Because it happened at the flood, and it's going to happen again. Now, I would like to answer right here an accusation that many people make about this story. One of the things that preachers often don't do, they don't answer the questions people are asking, but I'm going to. One of the things that not just unbelievers, but even many thinking Christians ask, wasn't the flood a case of cosmic overkill? Did God go a little too far to, I mean, wipe out every living thing on earth? Did God have to destroy the entire world? And what right did God have to do that? Well, the answer, a lot of people don't like either. God created everything, so he owns everything. 
and God can do what he wants with what belongs to him. God made the world, so he has a right to destroy it if by destroying it, it enables him to do greater blessing afterward, which is exactly what we see in the rest of Genesis. What is our problem? The problem today is that many people want what I call Burger King theology. Have God your way. If you go to Burger King, you can order a Whopper, you can cut the ketchup, cut the mustard, cut the pickles, cut the onions. In burger lingo, that was called a sissy. Lettuce, tomato, and mayo. I mean, it's serious. If you order, that's what they used to call it in the drive-ins. And many folks want God's love and mercy and forgiveness, but oh, we don't want God's holiness, righteousness, and judgment. But we can't pick and choose what God is like. Either we accept everything the Bible tells us about God, or we accept nothing. Because God is the one who gave us this book to reveal himself. And it's an entire, complete revelation. Let's look at what the Apostle Peter says about the flood and us Christians. I love this passage. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Peter says, First, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desires, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Referring to the second coming. Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have since the beginning of creation. That view is called uniformitarianism, that the earth and the universe is a closed system and nothing ever is input into it to change things. How does Peter respond to that? We we think these ideas are new. They're not new. People have believed this stuff in ancient times. If God could disrupt the world's natural processes once in history during the flood... God can do it again at the second coming of Christ in the future. Only this next time, God is going to destroy the world not with water, but with fire. Reminds me of one of my favorite Robert Frost poems, Fire and Ice, which, by the way, Frost actually has references to this passage we just read in Peter in Fire and Ice, among a lot of other things. So this is how far God will go to stop sin. He will either wash the world and clean it with water, like he did the first time, or he will purify the world by fire, like he's going to do next time. Now, here's a topic that's not popular, but God also created hell, a place not just for Satan and his fallen angels, but also for people who don't want God in their lives. Hell is not a popular subject these days either, and it's one of the first items that gets cut on Burger King theology. C.S. Lewis once wrote, I don't like the Bible's teaching about hell, and I agree with him. I don't like the teaching, but I believe it because God has revealed it. But someone has said, the horror, the revulsion that you and I feel when we think about someone going to hell, that that is a human inkling of how God feels when he looks at our sins. Did you get that? That the revulsion we feel about thinking of an eternal hell, that's the revulsion God feels to an infinite degree about our sin. And that's one of the reasons that God created hell. But please listen to me if you don't get anything else. If all I talked about today was the flood, the fire, and hell, we'd miss the most important truth of all. If you want to know how far God will go to stop sin, look no farther than the incarnation and the cross. To stop sin, the infinite, holy God stooped and became a helpless baby, a sinless man named Jesus. And then God let wicked, evil men mock and torture and murder Jesus on the cross. But not just that. In addition to what human beings did to Jesus, God himself unleashed the deluge of his wrath, the torrents of his wrath to fall on Jesus so that he could die in our place and bear that punishment that we deserved. In a real sense, the New Testament tells us God himself was in Christ being punished for our sins. He suffered the pains of hell that we would suffer 
to keep us from going there. So for us to be saved, to be forgiven and to escape hell, that is how far God has gone to stop sin. Not just the judgment, but he bore that judgment himself. And now God asks, do you believe that he did that? Today, early in this new year, God is giving you a wonderful opportunity to believe the good news that Jesus, the perfect God-man, died for your sins and arose. Will you come to God today admitting to him that you are an unworthy sinner? that your sins have hurt and angered and offended a holy God and believe that Jesus took your place on the cross, dying as your substitute. If you have never settled your eternal relationship with God, why not trust in Christ today, early in this new year, and then come and grow spiritually with us here at Lafayette Bible Chapel. We would love for you to be part of our family. So we have seen how far God will go to stop sin. The flood, the fire, hell, the incarnation, the cross. Now in our remaining few minutes, let us look at the second question. How far Noah will go to obey God? God was so important to Noah that Noah staked his reputation his family, his future, and his life on doing everything God told him to do. Let's look at a practical lesson that the Apostle Peter draws from Noah's life for us Christians. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And if God didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, his family, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Verse 9 is a wonderful promise to every one of us Christians. Just as the Lord saved Noah and his family in a very wicked world before the flood, so the Lord can rescue and protect us in a world that is coming to pieces. And you don't have to look very far to know that from our country to the rest of the world, it is coming to pieces fast. Noah was the first preacher mentioned in the Bible, and I suppose his message was telling people they needed to repent and live righteously or the flood would destroy them. Now, the Bible doesn't give us any details, but Noah must have been the laughingstock of his generation. Imagine a preacher today constructing a boat that is half the length of the Titanic in a cornfield in Nebraska. Imagine what the media would do with that. I mean, they'd be all over it. He would they'd plant a circus there permanently. So Noah also happens to be the first doomsday preacher in history. And boy, do the cartoonists and Hollywood love to make fun of doomsday preachers. The problem is Hollywood folks are talented, but they don't have a clue about the Bible. So when it comes to satirizing preachers, they put all of us preachers together in the same category with idiotic doomsday preachers. And of course, some of us probably deserve that satire. Now, the question we have to ask is, why would Noah deliberately place himself under this kind of ridicule and scorn? Well, the New Testament tells us why in a very important verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. What is faith? Faith means Noah believed God's word was true. Just like we open the Bible and read it and have a choice of believing or not believing what we read, However Noah heard it in an audible voice or in his mind, it was the real word of God, he believed it. And he didn't just believe it, he did what God told him to do. But notice it also says in this verse that that Noah built the ark because he was afraid of drowning. He knew that if he didn't obey God, he'd die, and his family would too. Brothers and sisters, there's many things in this world that we need to have a healthy fear of. And we need to teach our children and teach our grandchildren to have a healthy fear of things 
so that their lives can be saved. For example, we need to fear electricity. We need to fear hazardous chemicals, dangerous machinery. We need to be afraid of infectious disease and heavy traffic, and I suppose storms. In other words, we need to have a healthy fear of things that can kill us. Listen to me, please. We need to have a reverent respect for God and a healthy fear of Him. Because if we play fast and loose with God's Word and flaunt our sin in His face, God may discipline us by letting sin and its consequences catch up with us and, even for a believer, kill us. You see, Christians... God expects us to play by the same rules as everybody else. We're not exempt. In fact, we're more under the gun than anybody else because it's part of our testimony. Now, that's not a popular message today, and it wasn't a popular message in Noah's day, but because Noah believed what God said, obeyed God, and feared God, he and his family survived the flood, and everybody else drowned. And a day is coming, perhaps soon, when God is going to take a generation of Christians out of this world, and unbelievers are going to be left behind to face a deluge of disasters that this world has never seen before. Our study in Genesis could not be more timely. Here at the beginning of another new year that brings us closer to Jesus coming back. Let's look at what Jesus himself said in the Gospels, comparing the time of Noah to the very time we live in today beginning in Matthew chapter 24, as the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. So this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. And just in case somebody didn't get it, Jesus said it a second time, Luke 17. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Notice that Jesus says here that people in Noah's generation were living as though the world would go on forever. They rejected Noah's message. They rejected his warning, so they were not prepared when the end came. They kept on living life's normal physical activities, good things, maintaining healthy bodies, uh, starting new families, those are good things, but they did not go further and do the spiritual activities that would make them right with God and so ready for the flood. And I think that's how God wants you and me today to live and be prepared for the coming of Christ. Think about it. No one his family had to keep eating while they built the ark. Noah's sons got married in the years leading up to the flood. God wants us believers to keep on living and carrying on with life's normal activities, but also to do the spiritual things in our lives to prepare us for Christ's coming. It's not one or the other, it's both. Both living well and living well spiritually, the two together. Let's finish this morning by looking at Genesis chapter 6. The key text on Noah. We looked at the key text on God. Now let's look at the key text on Noah, beginning in verse 8. Noah, however, in contrast to the whole world, found favor in the sight of the Lord. That word favor is also the word we see throughout the Old Testament, grace. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. And Noah did this at the end of the chapter, that is, he built the ark. He did everything God had commanded him. Look at five things in this passage. First of all, the key to everything else, Noah found grace, our favor in the sight of the Lord. This is the key to everything else. We don't just step out on our own strength to obey. We obey by God's grace, by his favor in our lives. Second, Noah was righteous. He was rightly related to God, but he also did what was right. And those two go together. To be rightly related sets us on the path to do what is right before God. Then notice Noah was blameless. That means that no one could justly blame Noah for anything wrong. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't sinless. But no one could justly accuse him when they looked at his life. Do you know there are very few people 
in the Bible and very few people in our experience that can really be called blameless. But that's a goal that we should all have. Noah walked with God. He had a dynamic relationship with God every day of communion, fellowship, and growth. To walk with someone implies you're going somewhere. It implies that you agree with them. And that's a picture not only of Enoch that we saw in chapter 5, but also of Noah, the only two men in Scripture that it says they walked with God. And finally, this incredible phrase, Noah did everything that God had commanded him. I want to camp on that. Brothers and sisters, can these things be said about your life? If they can't, don't be discouraged. That is why we are here at Lafayette Bible Chapel, to receive instruction from the Lord and to grow together. It's a lifelong journey. And don't feel so bad. Noah got a 500-year start on the rest of us. So, You know, if he was this great at the age of 600, you know, he had a little bit more time than we do. So God is patient, praise his name. But here's something else. Because Noah trusted God, God entrusted to Noah the human responsibility to save the world. You say, well, man, that's so beyond anything we could do. No, it isn't. When we read the word, what has God done for us? He has revealed the future to us just like he revealed the future to Noah. God entrusted to Noah the responsibility to save the world. He's done the same thing with us. Not to save the entire planet and the species, but God has entrusted to us the responsibility to save one lost soul at a time as we present the gospel. And just as God's grace enabled Noah to do what he did, God's grace will enable you and me to live this way and to share the gospel as his representatives. Noah was one of the most remarkable men who ever lived. Not perfect, but he just did everything God told him to do. How about that for a New Year's resolution, brothers and sisters? It's still time to make a New Year's resolution. Most of our New Year's resolutions are so puny and pathetic. I mean, eat less chocolate this year, or save more room for ice cream this year. I mean, how about this? Do everything that God shows you to do this year. How about that for a New Year's resolution? As you come to these messages, I think God will speak to you through the words that I share, or as you read the Bible on your own, or as you attend a Bible study, as you listen to Christian songs. However, God will show you little things and big things. And when he does, don't rebel. Ask God Lord, you've shown me to do this. Now help me to do this. Give me the desire to do this. And God will. One last question, and we're done. Why should we do everything that God asks us to do? Maybe you've never thought about it before, but just think with me, please. Just as our sin hurts God, our obedience encourages God. Let's back up real quick to chapter 5 of Genesis, and look at what Noah's father, Lamech, said when his son was born. Lamech was 182 years old when he fathered his son, and he named him Noah, saying, this one will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. Noah's name means relief or comfort. And his father, Lamech, gave Noah this name, half as a prayer, half as a prophecy, and little could his father have realized how much Noah would grow up to fulfill his name. Do you realize that as the Savior of the world at that time, Noah was a comfort to every living thing, his whole family and all the animals, and most of all, God himself. We talked about how God felt when he looked out at the whole world in rebellion, how grieved God was. How do you think God felt when he looked down on the world and he saw one man taking a stand for him, Noah. Noah, who stood firm in his generation, who wanted to know God, to love God, to serve God. And Noah would do this regardless of what the cost was, no questions asked, no ifs, ands, or buts. Noah was willing to do anything in order to please God. 
how that must have thrilled God's heart when he saw Noah. Brothers and sisters, that's why we need to do everything God asks us to do. Not what we can get out of it, but because as we simply trust God and obey him, it will encourage God. It will comfort God. It will thrill God. Does that give significance to our little lives? Does that give worth and dignity and value to the lives that we think aren't important? Of course it does. Imagine you and me, by simply doing what God says, we can cheer the supreme being of the universe. How about doing that together in 2013? Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we get to know you, we would get to know your heart better. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be grieved by the sin and the evil in the world as yours is. Father, help us to be your ambassadors, your representatives, your change agents in this world with the gospel and also with Christian love and service. And I pray, Father, that we would be like Noah, willing to do everything that you show us to do this year. I pray that for myself. I pray that for every person here and all those who will listen to this video around the world. Father, help us to do everything you ask us to do, not for us, but because it will comfort and cheer and encourage you. We love you, Father, and ask this in your name. Amen. God bless you.